are continuing a series that will take us through the month of uh, January, and the series is entitled Rhythm, Discovering the Power of a Rule of Life. And as we talked about, uh, the rule of life is a structure or rhythm for our lives that enables us to pay attention to God in everything we do. It's a way of ordering our lives. Whether you know it or not, you are ordering your life in a particular way right now. Uh, the question is, is that a way that is consistent with the way of Jesus? So you're restructuring our lives, and that's what a rule of life is uh, to be done for. And to be clear, a rule we mentioned is not a list of do's and don'ts. Like, that's not what we're talking about when we say a rule of life. What we're talking about is a framework, a structure. How are you ordering your lives in ways that deepen Christ in you and allow you to express Christ to the world. And so it's a structure, uh, the trellis, uh, which enables a grapevine to grow upward and outward to bear much fruit instead of just keeping the vine on the ground there. And so we're looking at the distinguishing practices that make us who we are at New Life Fellowship. And so we started out by talking about rest, how are we structuring our lives to include rest in our worship to God and in our discipleship. We talked about prayer last week. How do we orient our lives to have a life of prayer, deep prayer in God. And today we're talking about relationships, which might be the most complex out of the four aspects of our rule of life. And so we're going to have to do some nuancing today. And so essentially the question that I want to explore is what are the practices or relationships that we need to structure in our lives to be a community that loves like Jesus? And so we're going to look at John 15 and enter into this passage today. And so let's pray. Let's invite the Spirit of God to speak to us as we enter into this passage of Scripture today. Father, thank you for your love, which is better than life. I pray that you would breathe on us as we hear Scripture, as we hear your word proclaimed this morning. Lord, may we encounter you in fresh ways by the power of your Spirit. So we offer this time to you. May your kingdom come in this place. May your will be done. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said... Amen. There's a story in American history that stands out and continues to resonate in the minds of people in this country. Uh, It happened in 1991 in Los Angeles. A man by the name of Rodney King, an African-American man, was brutally attacked by seven police officers. And after some time, three of the officers were acquitted. And many think that their acquittal led to the L.A. riots, which saw over 65 people die in it. And during the riots, if you were um, old enough to remember, or maybe you heard about it in the news later on, uh, Rodney King appeared on television during the riots, and he gave a plea that became one of the most famous lines in race relations in our country. And his line very simply was, can't we all just get along? Can't we all just get along? And this phrase stands out as one of the more important and revealing statements and questions in our country. And throughout the years, it's a question that we come back to. Can't we all just get along? And as we think about the church, that's one of the questions that we probably think about as we think about the outside world. Can't we all just get along? And as important as this question is, as it pertains to how we react and respond to those in the outside world, I would say that the more urgent uh, application of that question is not how we are to get along with the outside world. It's how we are to get along, first and foremost, with each other. How do we get along with each other? The the, the church is to be the place that demonstrates the love of God towards each other. And our love is to be the best sign of who God is and what his nature is like, so much so that when the world sees our love for each other, They begin to question and begin to think about the reality of a God that might exist out there. I love apologetics. I love the defense of the gospel. I love thinking about all the ways that we can defend Christianity and defend the gospel and Jesus and all that. But the best apologetic, the best defense of the gospel that we have is not some argument that we come up with. It's really our love for one another. Can't we all just get along? One of the more uh, difficult moments that parents experience is seeing their children at odds with each other. Few things bring parents heartache, like seeing their children fighting. 
like seeing their children not getting along with each other. Whether it's small children or whether it's grown adults, parents have a hard time seeing their children fight. And one of the, sa- one of the things that grieves the heart of God is seeing his children fighting seeing his children not getting along. And one of the greatest things that gives God joy and delight is to see his children loving one another. And so as we think about our rule of life this morning, as it pertains to the area of relationships, the question really is, how do we love like Jesus commands us to? And so for all of us in this room, there's a lot of application for all of us in one way or another. This message applies to those of you, to those that are in a small group at New Life that you meet with five to seven to 10 people on a regular basis. When you think about this message, think about how you relate to those in your small group. As you think about this message, think about those, for those of you that volunteer in some capacity with other people, think about those people that are in your ministry team or on your ministry team, those people how you're supposed to love. When you think about this message, think about the, the general relationships you have with people in our church and the relationships you have outside of our church, whether with your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, whatever it is. When you think, hear this sermon, think about that network of relationships that you have because there's some application for us. And Jesus, when he, when he speaks about relationships, he gives us very clear and strong words. What does it mean for a follower of Christ to relate to other people? And we see it in John chapter 15, beginning in verse number 9, following right where Pete left us off last week. John 15, beginning in verse number 9, hear the word of God. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Stop there. Unbelievable. If you think about anything this week, think about that. As the Father has loved Jesus, so has Jesus loved you. Mm, That's good. Now, remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as as, as I have kept my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Notice there's this progression. Jesus loves us. And then his love produces joy in us. Very few people love like joyful people. And then he says, my command is this, love each other. He didn't say my suggestion is this. If you think about it, do this. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Help us, Lord, as I have loved you. And then he closes this section out by saying this, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Amen. When we pick up in our text, Jesus is giving some final words to his disciples before he goes to the cross. And what we find here in this chapter is essentially Jesus narrowing down his teaching and essentially his dreams that he has for his disciples. For three years, Jesus has taught them about the kingdom of God. For three years, Jesus has demonstrated the power of the kingdom of God. For three years, Jesus has shown them the heart of the Father. And now Jesus is getting very simple. He doesn't want to mince words. He wants to be very simple and clear as it pertains to how his followers are to live as his followers. And so if you can narrow it, everything that Jesus said, if you can narrow it down to one word, it's the word that Pete shared with us Last week, Jesus says, if you're going to live the kind of life that I've been teaching over the last three years, there's only one word that you're going to need, and the word is abide. You're going to have to learn how to abide. You cannot be a Christian unless you abide. You cannot experience what God has for us as sons and daughters until we abide. You cannot do anything unless you abide. Jesus says, you cannot do anything apart from me. You must abide. And so this word abide in the Greek language is the word meno. And we've talked about this a couple of years ago, if you recall. Uh, probably you don't, but the, the, meno is the word, the Greek word to, to, to speak about this word abide. And look at the range of meaning of this word abide, meno. It means to dwell with, to abide. Abide means to remain, to stay, to dwell, to continue to be present, to continue in relationship, to tolerate or endure, to wait, to accept, to suffer for, to submit to, to act in accord with, to be faithful to. Do these words describe your relationship with God this morning? To endure, to wait, to stay with, to continue to be present. 
That word abide, that word meno, appears not five times in the Gospel of John, not ten times in the Gospel of John, not twenty times in the Gospel of John. Sixty-three times in the Gospel of John, Jesus is saying something to the effect of, you must abide in me. You must abide in me. You must dwell. Now, one of the ways that I've remembered this word abide is to think about an image of tea. And I shared this a couple of years ago about tea. As many of you... uh, uh, many of you might be, I'm a tea drinker, and there are two ways of drinking tea. Allow me to break it down for you. Two ways of drinking tea. The first kind of way to drink tea is to be a dipper. You take the tea bag and you just you dip it in and you dip it out. You dip it in and you dip it out. Those are dippers. How many dippers do we have in the house? Just wave at me if you're a dipper. Okay, not a lot of tea drinkers. Then there's dwellers, Okay. Work with me with this illustration, people. Uh, then there's, then there's, there's dippers, and then there's dwellers. Dwellers are just those. They just, they just put the tea bag in the cup, in the mug, and they just let it go. How many dwellers? Any, any dwellers? Oh, look at you guys. So spiritual. <laughs> there are two ways to drink tea. You can dip, and most of us, when we think about tea, it's, really, it's a good metaphor for the spiritual life. We're dipping in, and we're dipping out. We're dipping in and we're dipping out. We're dipping in and we are dip, we dipping on Sunday and we dip back out. We dip in for Bible study, we dip back out. But the life of a follower of Jesus is not to be a dipper. It's to be a dweller. It's to just dwell in there. Because what begins that when you just let it dwell in there. One person said, the reason, Pastor, that I don't like to let it just dwell there is because the tea gets too strong. And I thought that's what happens with God. That if you just sit there with God, all of a sudden, God's presence gets a little too, you start getting convicted of stuff that if you're a dipper, you're not convicted anymore. But once you start dwelling, the Holy Spirit starts speaking to you in ways, and it's just like, maybe not. When you dwell, all of a sudden, the the tea begins to permeate the water. And, And listen, when you're a dipper, you're doing all the work when you're dipping. Don't dip like this, by the way, okay? But you're doing all the work when you're dipping. But when you're dwelling, it's just all of a sudden, God begins to do in you what you could not do in yourself. And so all of a sudden, you're not trying to bring, bring, give effort to loving someone. All of a sudden, there's something that God does inside of you that you're beginning to love a little more effortlessly. You're forgiving. Forgiveness at one point used to be hard, but you spend some time in the presence of God. You spend some time dwelling in God's presence. All of a sudden, you're more apt to forgive someone. What is that? That's dwelling. That's meno. If you're you're a dipper, you might have you find a hard time being generous. But if you dwell enough in God's presence, all of a sudden, generosity just starts spilling out of you. The question is, are we dippers or are we dwellers? Jesus says, if you're going to live in my way, you're going to have to dwell. And so if you're drinking tea this week, just make sure you're just let, just let it dwell there. Let it get strong there. When you're dipping, you have to make it happen on your own effort. When you dwell, all of a sudden, God begins to do in things inside of you that you could not do in yourself. And so Jesus says, if you're going to follow in my way, you must learn to abide, dwell. And the abiding Jesus notes here is not just so that we can have a great time with God. When we abide and dwell, it's not just so that we can have a great time with God. That would be so if Jesus ended right after that. But Jesus, after he says we are to dwell, he then tells us why we are to dwell, not just for our relationship with God, but because of our relationship with others. If we're going to be what God calls us to be, we must abide, not just for our relationship with God, but for our relationship with others. And so Jesus, after he says all this language about abide in me, dwell in me, stay in me, right after this, Jesus says these words, now love each other as I have loved you. You cannot love each other as Jesus has loved us if you're not dwelling. And so Jesus says, love each other as I have loved you. And how does Jesus love us? He tells us. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. And the Father loves Jesus. And if you, if you just think about it to his logical conclusion, if the Father loves Jesus in that way, and Jesus loves us as, as the Father loves us, then we are to love others as Jesus has loved us. How does you, and, and the love of the Father. And so now it makes more sense why Jesus said we must abide in him. Because to love like Jesus cannot happen in human strength. 
To love like Jesus needs to happen in the strength and the power of God. And so Jesus in the Gospels tells these disciples that he's been mentoring and discipling for three years. He says, now you guys love one another. And when you think about Jesus' disciples, you begin to realize how impossible these words are from a human standpoint. Jesus commands his disciples, love one another. Have you seen his disciples? Have you seen the disciples that Jesus gathered together to love one another? It's not a pretty picture. If, if there, it's one thing if Jesus gathered his disciples based on shared interests, based on common values, based on just uh, personality types that can uh, just mesh with one another. And then he said, all right, guys, love one another. We said, oh, this is pretty easy. I got stuff in common with this guy. There's some shared values, our personalities. But when Jesus gathered his 12 disciples together, he gathered people that were so different from one another and then had the audacity to say, now love one another. Him? You want me to love him? And when you look at the, the Gospels, the Gospels begin to describe who these disciples are. And when you analyze the list of disciples, you begin to realize to love like Jesus is impossible in human strength, but it's possible in God's strength. Take two of Jesus' disciples that he taught, called together and said, I want you to be part of the same small group. And I want you to look at these names so that next time you're in a small group with someone you can't stand, uh, just remember Jesus, uh, how he gathered his disciples together. Two guys that were connected, one guy named Matthew and another guy named Simon. Jesus calls these two guys together from different worlds and then says, love one another. Now, look how different these guys are. Matthew was a tax collector. Simon was a tax protester. Love one another. Matthew collected revenue for the Romans. Simon was a rebel against the Romans. Love one another. Matthew was wealthy. Simon was a commoner. And Matthew lived to make his money by overcharging people like Simon. Simon lived to kill people like Matthew. And then Jesus has the audacity to say, as I have loved you, love one another. Now it makes sense why we need to abide, why we need to dwell. Because unless the power of God flow in us and through us, it is impossible to love like Jesus loves. And so Jesus gathers people together. So the next time you're in a small group with someone you can't stand, just remember these disciples here. It's no accident that Jesus connected these guys together. And he's saying, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to learn to have a heart for people who don't look like you. You're going to have to love people who don't think like you. You're going to have to love people that don't vote like you. Help us, Lord. You're going to have to uh, love people who don't act like you. And Jesus is basically saying that a good measure of discipleship is not how much Bible I have in my head, but the state of my heart towards people different than me. You want to know a real disciple is not someone who can memorize the Bible. It's someone who has a heart for people, especially those that are different from them. That's what Jesus says. If you love those that love you, Big deal. Even the Pharisees and tax collectors do that. Everyone does that. But if you love someone that's different than you, if you love someone that you're having a hard time, uh oh, now you're loving in the way that. So let me ask you today who are you having a hard time loving today? One way to assess it is to just look at who you are avoiding, okay? Whoever you're avoiding, this is a good picture of who you're having a hard time loving. Who are you avoiding today? Who are you having a hard time loving? Jesus wants us to love as he loves. And so Jesus, he, he, his commands, he says, my love essentially when you dwell in me is to melt away the kind of division that keeps us from each other. And notice he says, he doesn't say this interesting word. Jesus doesn't say, now I command you to tolerate one another. He doesn't say tolerate one another. He says love one another. Now, our country, our society, especially this country, has a big thing about tolerance. And it's like a, it's a big core value of our country, tolerance. We, we, but you think about it. Think about the word for a moment. It's, it's not really that impressive. It doesn't feel good when you say we're just tolerating each other. 
Think about looking at your boyfriend, your girlfriend, just say, listen, I tolerate you. <laughs> you know, that doesn't feel too good. It's just like, uh, thank you, I think, thank you, you know. You look at your kid, just like, son, I tolerate you. It's just like, um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's a compliment. I don't know what that is. And so the world has the lowest common denominator, tolerate each other, put up with each other. But Jesus doesn't say, I command you this, tolerate one another. He says, love one another. Jesus raises the standard for his disciples, which is why we are to abide in him and dwell in him. Because we, listen, you can tolerate people without the power of God very easily. You cannot love people without the power of God. You need the, especially difficult people without the power of God. And so Jesus invites us to this kind of life, abide in me, and this abiding is to lead to a certain way that we attach ourselves to others. As we abide in Jesus, we learn what it means to attach our lives to others, to attach our lives to others in love. And so uh, with this basically background here, I want to go into our rule of life. What does it mean now to structure our lives, to order our lives, to form our lives in such a way that we're loving one another. And what I want to do is I want to focus today on just four types of relationships that our church really collectively, we are to come together and wrestle with these kinds of relationships together. Very intentionally so. If you call New Life Fellowship your home, whether you're a member or not a member, whatever, if, you're, if this is where you're at, we are called to wrestle together with these four types of relationships to love like Jesus loves. And these are, this is not an exhaustive list, but I want to talk about four. And at the end of our time, we're going to wait for the Holy Spirit to speak to us as it pertains to how are we going to focus uh, on a particular relationship starting this week. Four types of relationship that are going to help us flourish as the people of God. The first kind of relationship are relationships that cross barriers. Relationships that cross barriers. To be part of new life our rule of life, we are about relationships that cross barriers. Our second M is our multiracial value. It means we are bridging racial, cultural, economic, and gender barriers, and I would say generational barriers for Christ. And our first task as a church is to cross barriers and love each other primarily by listening to one another. In order to love in the way that Jesus calls us to by crossing barriers, of people that we would typically not be involved with, it takes us listening to do that. And so this is why my invitation, as you hear this, this is why we are to spend time reading and learning about America's great sin of slavery and the impact that racism continues to have on African-American brothers and sisters. Because we are entering into that, we're crossing a barrier now. We're listening now. We're entering into that world. And as New Life Fellowship, as part of our rule of life, we are to cross these kind of barriers. This is why we are to pay attention to global immigration and the crisis that's happening around the world. Thinking about, you know, people relocating to another country. And time and time again, I meet people in our own lobby downstairs that come to our church that have immigrated from another country. And they're so disoriented, trying to figure out their way, don't know the language, don't have any connections, but they are here. And the invitation for us is, how do we now enter into the experience of an immigrant? How do we enter into the experience of someone that knows nothing of this land here? How do we do it? It's the kind of relationship that we're to cross barriers into. This is why we are to pay attention and, and, and to the economically poor. By our relationships, how many people are you in relationship with that are not in your tax bracket? How many people, uh, how many times have you tried to read and study and learn about what it means for those that are struggling in economic poverty and how you are to cross now a barrier that you typically would just stay over here with? But our rule of life is to, to shape our lives so that we cross barriers that we typically would stay on this side with. This is why I've been doing my best, especially in recent time, to think about and, and reflect on the inequality of, of that women experience in our country and around the world. As a man, I enjoy male privilege. And all us men enjoy male privilege in this country and around the world. What does it look like for, that women have experienced this kind of inequity and oppression around the world? We're crossing barriers now. This is why I spend time trying to learn about millennials in this generation. 
and think about how they think about God and what are their values, entering into their world. And so at New Life Fellowship, part of our rule of life means that we have relationships that cross barriers, that make us a little uncomfortable. And Jesus is the one who models this for us because Jesus left a world that he was very familiar with. He left heaven and he incarnates into the world. He leaves his world and enters into another world. And this is the invitation for us to leave what we're familiar with all the time to enter into unfamiliar territory. And so this year, my prayer for you is that this year you will enter into unfamiliar territory and relationships with people that are so different than you. Different than you in terms of their socioeconomic class. Different from you in terms of culture and race. Different from you across the board that we would just step out of what we're familiar with. And entering, that's what it means to love like Jesus loves. We enter into their world. This is why next month we have a racial reconciliation conference, February 27th. And my hope is that as many new lifers can come. Because we want to be intentional about what does it mean to enter into the space of someone that's different than us. And how do we create communities of reconciliation and unity? And my prayer is that you would register for that. It's February 27th, and that we would learn together what it means to be the people of God in Queens, New York City. That's the first kind of relationship, relationships that cross barriers. The second kind of relationship that we are to be focusing on as a church collectively and individually is our marriages and single relationships. Our marriages and our single relationships. The theme of marriage comes up over and over and over again in Scripture. The Bible begins with a wedding. The middle of the Bible, the Song of Songs, is a book that depicts the erotic and sensual nature of a a marital intimacy. Jesus, when he begins his ministry, he does his first miracle at a wedding. The Bible ends with this consummation of the bride and the bridegroom. Jesus, our bridegroom. And and, and so from Genesis to Revelation... We see this image of marriage and a wedding throughout. And so that vision is to shape the way we are married to our spouses. And the invitation for us is that we order our rule of life in such a way that we're paying attention to how we're growing together as a married couple, for those of us that are married in this room. We're paying attention to to how we are married as a couple. That our mission statement as married people is to bring, as we say, the good news of salvation to our spouses, that our spouses are loved and lovable. What's your job description as a married person? To bring the good news to your spouse, that your spouse is loved and your spouse is lovable. To be married means that we invest in our marriages as much or maybe even more as we invested in the wedding. Let that pause for a second. Let's just sit there for a second. For those of you who got mad, m- m- vast majority of people, when they, when they invested in, they've invested in their wedding. That photographer cost a lot of money. That honeymoon, the, all that went into it, a lot of thought. You guys were together. I mean, at least I just licked the stamps, and I just, that was my job, licking the stamps as Rosie did everything else there. But you guys were together. You thought about it. And then after you invested all that time together to put a wedding together, we don't, we don't continue giving the kind of thought and time of putting a marriage together. And so at New Life, we are to be a community that takes our marriages seriously, that is more than just a wedding day, that it's about really how we're building a life together. And as many of you know, marriage is hard. It's hard. I remember going to a premarital, Rosie and I, we, we were dating, we were engaged, we went to a premarital seminar, and the, and the guy said, and he was with his wife, and he said, just so you know, as a rule of thumb, sometimes it takes about 10 years to learn how to be married. And most people were very depressed in the room, just like, oh, 10 years? And I looked at Rosie, I said, we'll get it in two or three, we'll get it in two or three. In two weeks, Rosie and I will be married for 10 years. It's taken 10 years. Uh, uh... I think I'm just now starting to get, oh, I think I get the hang of it now. 
When I buy a slice of pizza, you know, I just don't buy a slice of pizza for myself anymore. <laughs> I've made the mistake of buying a slice of pizza and then going home with the slice of pizza. <laughs> and I walk in the door, and I'm just eating the slice of pizza. And Rosie goes, where's my slice of pizza? And I go, I didn't know you wanted a slice of pizza. You could have called me to ask me if I wanted a slice of pizza. Red gave me great wisdom a couple of years ago. He says, that's why you eat the slice of pizza before you get home. <laughs> How dare you, Red? We're going to pray for you at the end of the service. <laughs> Wipe the sauce off, too, before you go in the house, all right? <laughs> Marriage is hard, and, and, and to be formed, our rule of life should be paying attention to how do we form our marriages. And the same applies to our single relationships. For those of you that are single in this room, the relationships you have is critical to your spiritual formation. And just because you are single doesn't mean that you don't have, you, you can't have relationships that are intimate and close and loving, and you might be single in this room for a myriad of reasons, maybe by your own choice, or maybe because you haven't found someone yet, or maybe because of divorce or death, but you find yourself as a single person. But even though you are single, God has created you to bond with other people. And actually, when you look at Jesus, who was a single person, when you look at his life and examine his life, you see how Jesus uh, significantly redefined singleness and even redefined family. Deb Hirsch, I love what Deborah Hirsch, she, she wrote a wonderful book called Redeeming Sex. And, and part of it, this is what she says. She says, I am glad that Jesus was a single man. Not just because he avoided uh, putting his wife and children through the trauma of the cross, but because of him, we find the redemption of singleness. Jesus breaks the fi fixation with mere biological bonds and creates a new family where all can belong by virtue of their relationship to God through him. There can be no such thing as a single person in God's expansive family. And so as a single person, the cultivation of relationships is, is critically important to our formation. This is why we have small groups at New Life, that we want to intentionally create context, whether it's for married people or single people, to connect, because in those contexts, bonds are formed, and you cannot have a flourishing uh, spiritual Christian life without good friendships and relationships. So whether you're married or single, your rule of life should be thinking intentionally about my marriage and my single relationships and friendships. If I can go a little further about that, the third kind of relationship that we need to be focusing on in our rule of life together as a church family is what I'm calling intentional formation relationships. Intentional formation relationships. And by that, there are really three kinds of, if I could put three subpoints under that, this is what I mean by that. The first kind of relationship is like just peer relationships. All of us in this room, uh, we would do well to have good, healthy peer relationships. And this is basically the kind of relationship I'm talking about, where there is a common, commonality, and you add, to that commonality, a shared interest, you add consistency to that and vulnerability. That all of us should have relationships that with peers, that's something in common. And over time, and you're consistent in that connection, and you're vulnerable in that connection. And over time, it is those kind of relationships that really form us and shape us into who Jesus wants us to be. The other kind of relationships of intentional formation relationship is, is you, everyone in this room needs some kind of mentor in our lives, someone in our lives that's ahead of us, that can show us the way and show us the ropes. Throughout my 17, 18 years of following Jesus, I thank God that time and time again, God has placed people in my life. And many times I had to search for these people. Sometimes God dropped them in front of me, and other times I had to search for mentors and search for people and connect myself to people that were ahead of me. Because you cannot live this life without someone that is, has been, who's discipling you, who's mentoring you. And all of us need that kind of relationship in our lives. And third, we all need the kind of relationship where we are really discipling someone else. 
pouring into someone else. God has gifted so many of you with experiences and insights, and those insights are not to go to waste. They are to be deposited into someone else now. Whatever God's given you, he just didn't give you for you. He gave you so that you in turn would go back and begin to shape and mentor and form someone who is behind you, whether in years or experience. And so we all need intentional formation relationships in our lives. And that's why we talk about small groups as the context for this to happen. That's the third kind of relationship. And in a minute, we're going to give just a moment to just think about these. And last is This is the last kind of relationship that we are to be intentionally focusing on as we live out John 15 to love each other as Jesus has commanded us. The last kind of relationship is relationships with non-Christians. Relationships with non-Christians. One of the saddest realities of Christians is the longer that you're a Christian, the further you get from non-Christians in terms of really connecting with them. When you became a Christian, think about it. For those of you that are Christian in this room, that you say yes to Jesus, think about when you became a Christian, God lit a fire in you, and you said, I got to share this. And your network of friends, you said, let's go to church. And you started inviting your friends to church, and then you met some Christian friends. And the people who were in your life, all of a sudden, you're just getting further and further as the years go by. And this is not to be the way of Christianity. When you look at Jesus, Jesus was not called an acquaintance of sinners. His title was not acquaintance of sinners. His title was friend of sinners. Friend, Jesus was friend of sinners. And so many of us, we think, oh, but I'll get contaminated by them. Oh, my God, they're going to lead me astray, you know. I'll be in the club in two weeks if I was just with them there. And really, it's it's a really bad theology. It's a bad theology. That we think if, if, if I get close to anyone that's unrighteous, that in three seconds or less, I'm going to be unrighteous. You have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And you're wondering about being contaminated by someone who doesn't know Christ in less than three minutes. And so Jesus is friends of sinners. And he invites us, of course, in wise ways to connect our lives to non-Christians. And so my prayer this week for you is that as you think about your rule of life, that you're beginning to think about, Lord, who are those people that you've put in my life that are not Christian, that I'm here to cultivate friendship with? And listen, not so that we can just get them saved. That's why why non-Christians don't like Christians. We see them as a means to an end. I'll be your friend, but really, I just want to get you saved. And then after that, I'll, maybe I'll find somebody else. That, but Jesus is a friend of sinners. And whether they get saved or Christian, that, that's up to God. But our God is to befriend people that do not know God, do not know Christ. And so as you think about these four areas there, relationship that cross barriers, breaking, breaking down racial, cultural, economic, gender, generational barriers. As you think about your own marriage and single friendships, As you think about intentional formation friendships, as you think about relationships with non-Christians, what is God calling you to do right now? And so I want to give just a, a few moments of just silence for us. Diedrich Bonhoeffer said this. He said, we begin in silence because God should have the first word. We end in silence because God should have the last word. And I want to give us a moment of just stillness right now because I believe God wants to speak to us very clearly about how we are to respond to what we just heard today. That our rule of life is to, we are to order our lives as it pertains to our relationships. And maybe there's one or two or three or four of those areas that you just sense the Holy Spirit saying to you, you need to focus on that. This is what I'm calling you to focus on. I'm calling you to order your life in such a way that you cross barriers of people that that look nothing like you. I'm calling you to, to work on your marriage in ways that you haven't worked on it before. I'm calling you to to look for robust, intentional relationships for single people. I'm I'm calling you to have intentional formation relations. I'm calling you to be intentional with non-Christians. What's the Spirit of God speaking to you today? And so this is what I want to do. I want to invite the worship team to come forward, and I want you to just take this out for one moment. And I'm going to give you about a minute or two or so to just listen. We're going to just listen to the Holy Spirit together. And all of us in this room, and just think about the, Lord, what are you calling me to 
focus on this week. And in your time of prayer and all that, God will lead you and hopefully send people around your way uh, to help you make sense of it. But I want to take just a couple of minutes of silence. And as, you, and as you sense God speaking to you, I just want you to write it down in the relationships box. However you see, sense God calling you to, just write it down. And, make, and may this be your prayer this week. And then we're just going to close in a time of worship together. So let's take about a minute or two, and then we'll close in singing in response to God. Let's begin. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Lord, you laid down your life for us so that we can get to God, so that we can get to the Father. But Lord, you not only laid your life down for that, you laid your life down for us so that we can get to each other, to break down every barrier that we erect that keeps us from each other. And so, Lord, We cannot live this life unless you fill us with your power, your love, your strength. So teach us what it means to dwell like that tea bag. Dwell in it so that we may love the way that you do. We sing to you now, Lord, words of worship and praise. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, let's all stand, let's sing together. has no one than this and to lay his life down for his friends. Jesus Christ laid his life down for every one of you in this room. No greater love. And for some of you in this room, I want to invite the prayer team to come to my left and those offering the bread and the cup to come to my right. For those of you maybe you've never responded to this love that's been offered to you by God in the person of Jesus. Maybe you never said yes. live my life from that love. Maybe you've never said yes to Jesus. We have a prayer team to my left here. And if you sense God just tugging at you to say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, that you never said yes to Christ, our prayer team is here. We'd love to pray for you. The prayer uh, team is here as well. For those of you, you're, you're just having a hard time loving a person, a group. You just need the power of God's spirit in you, through you, and all that. We have our prayer team here to pray for you as well. Jesus died on the cross, not just so that we can get to the Father and love the Father, but that we can get to each other and love each other. So the cross is both vertical and the the cross is horizontal. We need both to live the kind of life he's calling us to. And so as we close, my prayer is that this week would be a week of 
sudden, you'll find yourself loving people that you had a hard time loving before. Because now it's not you loving, now it's God in you, loving through you. So we have the Lord's table here. For those of you that like to receive it, you can come up the center aisle and take the bread and dip it in the cup. No greater love than this. And we have our prayer team for whatever need you have, you can come up to receive a prayer. But as we close, I want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. And the reason if you're new, we close every gathering with our hands in this posture is because you cannot give what you have not received. You cannot give love if you have not received love. And so we end as a, a way of posturing our lives to receive God's love so that we may give it. And so with your hands and your hearts in a posture of receiving, brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you. May he fill you with his peace. May you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, learning how to dwell in God. And may his love flow in you and flow through you for the glory of his name. And so I bless you all today in the strong, in the beautiful, in the reconciling name of Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen. Grace and peace, everyone.